Are we ready for God's Word this morning? Okay, let's open our Bibles, please, if you would, with me, to the book of John, the Gospel according to John, uh, chapter 10, please. We're going to look uh, here shortly at a very well-known verse of Scripture that uh, it bears looking at. We don't, we don't talk about it a lot, but probably should more. Uh, but uh, we're going to begin a new series of messages that, uh, that we will look at, and I want to entitle... Uh, think big and live big. All right? So John chapter 10, uh, I'm going to give you just a couple of seconds more so we, I still hear pages rustling so we can all read it together. All right? John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come, this is Jesus speaking, that they may have life and that they may have it, how? Abundantly. abundantly. My version says more abundantly. Now, Jesus speaks here of an abundant life that he has come to give us. Let me say here before I keep going on, God wants you and me to live big lives. Now, to some of us, that might be a very foreign concept because we say we equate bigness, a big life with fame. We equate it with wealth. We equate it with li living a life under the uh, shining bright lights of Hollywood or, or New York or whatever, but uh, that's not God's idea of having a big life. You don't have to have a lot of money to have a big life. How many of y'all know that Mother Teresa, she was poor but did she live a big life? Right? I mean, Jesus, you know, himself came out of what city? Where did he grow up in? What city? Somebody. Nazareth, right? Didn't one of his uh, disciples say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Did Jesus live a big life? He is the single greatest influence in all of humankind. He did not have to live in a big city to make a big impact, did he? Right? So I want us to begin to warm up to this concept that God wants us to live a big life, regardless of your net worth, regardless of your notoriety or lack thereof, or in my case, being notorious. <laughs> But uh, God wants us to live big. Now, here in John chapter 10, verse 10, bear with me. We're going to get a little technical here with the Greek language. Uh, we said before that the Greek language is the most precise, the most exact language in all the history of the world. Okay, for example, how many words in our English language do we have for the word love? One. We use it indiscriminately, like, like, right? Like, I love my spouse, I love my kids, I love my grandkids, but we also use it of, I love my pets, I love cake, I love Starbucks, right? Or Maxwell House. <laughs> are they even in business anymore? <laughs> they, stay, uh, they still are good to the last drop. You're lucky they're in business, that's all the coffee you're going to <laughs> no, Cindy's hooked on Starbucks. I made sure when she came into the relationship, I was going to get her an IV, and boy, she is hooked. So I know my mama didn't raise no fool, Mr. Craig. <laughs> Good to the last drop, my foot. Yes. <laughs> so so we're, we use these words, this word love, indiscriminately. Now, the Greeks had four different words for the word love, much more precise. And they have four different words for the, for the word life, not one, four. One of them is bios. We get our English word biology from, right? Human life, animal life, uh, anastrophe, a manner of life. Uh, they also have... Um, Bios, anastrophe, I can't remember the, the third one, and then they have zoe. 
zoe. Zoe is used here in John chapter 10, verse 10. And it speaks of the highest quality of life that a, a human being can have in this life. The highest quality. Even as agape is the highest quality of love, right? We cannot improve on agape, the highest quality of love. And now, zoe is exactly equivalent to agape in that it is the highest quality of life. Agape is the God kind of love. Zoe is the God kind of life. Jesus said, I have come to give you zoe. I looked up in the uh, lexicon for a definition uh, for the word abundant. Not only is the word life the best possible quality of life you can have, but God wants to give us that type of life in small portions. I have come that you might have zoe and have it more how? Abundantly. Okay, so that word abundantly, parizos. In the Greek, it means exceeding abundantly and supremely. God wants us to have the best quality of life we could ever have, exceeding abundantly and supremely. Who believes that? How many of y'all know that your brain will probably go tilt? I don't have any concept of what that would look like. But in faith, we can choose to believe that simply because God said it. Amen? I bet you didn't know there was so much in John 10.10, 10, at least the last half of the verse. So God wants us to have that. You know, just, just speaking, Cindy and I engage in these conversations of, you know, what her life was like before the Lord and what her life is like now. And she's, she's really trying to talk to her children, saying, guys, I'm telling you, life with the Lord, am I telling the truth, babe? Life with the Lord is so much better than the way I used to live it, busting hell wide open. you who, Right? Uh, telling you, there is no greater life than life with the Lord. You know, uh, I won't, I won't give your testimony without your permission, honey. But she used to tell I used to pick all the wrong man. I said, honey, something was broken in you. <laughs> but you, but God finally sent you the right man. She, I'll just tell you, I'll just, I'll just tell him what, what, uh, you know, how many of y'all know that it's, it's, it's easier to ask for permission or for forgiveness than it is for permission. <laughs> so you all be praying for me, please, in advance. Uh, but she said she had several requests of the Lord. She didn't always pray them, but she said, you know what? She told her daughters, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find me a Mexican because Mexicans know how to keep their homes together. Am I telling the truth? She said, and she, would, she didn't say this to the Lord, but she said, man, I wish I had a portable pastor, someone I can pick the brain about the Bible. <laughs> Another qualification she had, she said, I want uh, someone who is faithful to go to church and loves the Lord. And then she said, I want to live in a country home. <laughs> she doesn't mind, she, she'll feed them, <laughs> Craig. <laughs> and, 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 and she can go on the list. And the Lord's given her everything. Am I right, babe? everything that she's thought of of what she wanted in a man and she didn't have to go looking for him. God provides. Now, can life get better? Do you believe, how many of y'all believe that even as good as life might be for you this morning or today, that life can get better yet? Because he wants to live this, he wa God wants us to live this high quality of life the highest quality of life there is in human existence to live it, remember, exceeding abundantly and supremely. You know, God doesn't promise us peace. He promises us peace that surpasses human understanding. How many of y'all know that God goes the extra mile with all of us? 
He doesn't just promise us joy. He promises us joy unspeakable and full of glory. Right? God doesn't just promise us companionship. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And if that is not until the end of the world. The scripture we were looking at uh, in Psalm chapter uh, 46, verses 1 and 2, that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. I mean, God goes beyond our expectations. Right? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can dare to ask or even imagine. Do we believe that, church family? Do we believe that? Now, let's look at some verses here. Uh, let's look at this verse in the Amplified Version of the Bible. Good. Thank you, Ms. Lark. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and, what's the next word? Enjoy life. How many of y'all believe that God wants you to enjoy your life? Do you believe that, church family? But how many Christians do I know that are barely tolerating their lives? They are barely surviving. And they believe that that's God's will for their lives. I have come that they, us, may have and enjoy life to the, and have it in abundance to the full till life overflows. Do we believe that, church family? Does your joy overflow where it affects other people? Does your peace, inner peace, overflow to where it affects other people? Does your... Do you have that shine that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 5, 16? Let your light so shine before men. How many of us know that God just doesn't want us to have a good life for us, but so that it can overflow to other people? I'm telling you, the kid that led me to the Lord when I was a sophomore in high school, uh, he had something I wanted and had been wanting for years as a young man. I was 15 years old. When I met that kid, I thought he was a nerd. I thought he was a geek. But he had a peace that I longed for and had been looking for and only knew from my interactions with him could only come through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's what sold me. It wasn't his persuasive ability to share the scripture with me. He did that. It was what his life spoke to me in volumes. He had something that I wanted desperately in my life. How many of us know that God wants ah, that agape, not that agape, but that zoe life to overflow to others? Here's another verse, 1 Timothy chapter 6. NIV, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who, how does God provide for us? How does God provide for us? He provides how many things for us? Everything for our what? Enjoyment. Do you believe that God provides every? Do you think that God just put the sun so that it could warm the planet? Don't you think that God gave us the sun for our enjoyment? How many of y'all know that God gave us the moon for our enjoyment? I mean, how many people look to the moon for romantic nights, those full moons? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, Ms. Robin. <laughs> Yet proof that uh, you can have snow on the roof and still have fire in the chimney. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Moving right along. God gives us everything for our enjoyment. Moving right along. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is what? Truly life. 
I believe that life in God, that is truly living. Amen? I'm not existing. Listen, I'm having the time of my life. I am in this all-out affair with Jesus Christ that I am unabashedly uh, so proud of that I've been having for 39 years. Life hasn't always been easy, but I'm telling you, our God has been faithful. And He has always been good. Amen? It's still the best life I could possibly live because I can tell you how low a life I had when I was just a young man. I wasn't even existing. I think I was just surviving, trying to keep head above water. And I wonder how many people live that way, just trying to tread water, keep head above water. Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, I'm the, my, my boyfriend doesn't do this. He doesn't want to work. He wants me to be his sugar mama. Baby, just get, kick his butt to the curb in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Can I go there a little bit? I mean, I know I like to meddle. <clears throat> and don't edit this out, Ms. Sheila. Please. You know, it astounds me how many beautiful women there are, young girls, that will hitch up with a guy that has, does not have a job, and these girls feel responsible to provide for an able-bodied young guy that has no drive to work, as the Bible said he should work. Because let me remind you, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I believe, says that he who does not work should not, what? Eat. Oh, Pastor Joe, you lost me there. You're so mean. You're so cruel. No, baby, you know what? I'm doing my share of working, and if he's able-bodied and of age, he should be doing his share of working. Amen. Right? Right? Now let me remind you again, sweetheart, if you want me to be biblical, before God gave uh, Adam the woman, he first gave him a J-O-B. Right? He said, tend the garden, work the garden, work the soil. That's called a job in my book. But a lot of girls are saying, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm always dragging his sorry butt. Kick him to the curb. And I always have heard, and I don't know why I hear, but he looks so good in those jeans. <laughs> Kick that butt in those jeans to the curb. <laughs> Who cares how good he looks, baby? When those bills come due, that butt's not going to help you at all. It's a sorry butt. We meddling? How many of y'all know I like to keep it real? Next scripture, please. For the one, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. For the one who wants to love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from uttering deceit. Notice, notice the emphasis on, on the first part of the verse. The one who wants to love life. How many of y'all know that as good as life might be for you, some of you who are experiencing it, you can love your life even more? You know, there's a saying, and, and excuse me, young people, I'm not going to quote it. I'm just going to give the, the abbreviations. FML in among youth people. That basically says, forget my life. It is so crummy. It is so terrible. Well, you know, I've, I've come up with one, L-M-L, -L, I love my life. How can we not? We serve such a big God, a gracious God, a generous God to love this life. So are we convinced, church family, that God wants us to live big and to let the Jesus in us to live big through us? Only two of you are convinced. <laughs> Miss Robin, I don't know what I'd do without you, darling. You who, right? God wants us to live big. Next verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13 out of the Message Bible. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter. Notice these descriptions, church family. Enter this wide open, spacious life. 
we didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within what? You. you. Your lives are not what? Small. They're not small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Notice the encouragement. Open up your lives. Live openly. Live expansively. Live big. But often, church family, listen to me carefully. Often we let life beat us down to where we live small and we think, well, this is my lot in life. I, life cannot get any better. You know, at that point, when we say that and we accept that thought into our lives, we ourselves have, have fenced our mind in to smallness. We have fenced our life in to smallness when God has given us the ability to live wide open, expansive lives before Him and before others. Who believes that? I believe that. Who's ever met people on your journey that live big lives because they love the big God? I have. You won't find them on the headlines of, uh, of breaking news. You won't find them on the newspapers. But the people in their world have taken note that that person lives a big life. Not because of themselves, but because they love a big God. So let me ask you this question. Are we fencing ourselves into smallness? Do we believe that smallness is what God wants us to do? I believe, church family, that God wants us to live big lives. I'm going to close with an illustration. I heard it from Joel Osteen. He said that there was a lady in his church that was, had kids, was living on uh, welfare, and uh, the only thing I got to say to that is, you know, if it's, if it's available there for you to help you up, amen, it's not available to enable you to live a life subpar, not in God. And, and she said she started thinking big that she didn't have to live like that for the rest of her life. And her kids did not have to do without the nice things of life. She decided that. And she began to work and believe God for opportunities. She began to take night classes. She began to get, she got her degree. And then she began working as a custodian at a high school. She did her night classes, got her degree, and she ended up being the principal of a different high school. And she said, I went from welfare to faring well. Because she decided she decided she was not going to live small. I wonder how many people have let their circumstances bury them in smallness. Instead of them looking to God and saying, you know, like those four lepers at the gate of Samaria, why do we sit here and die? Let's go into the camp of the Arameans, surrender our lives. Maybe they'll have pity on us and they'll help us to, to, to feed us because they were starving. There was famine in the land. They went into the camp and the Lord multiplied their steps to, the, to make it sound like a whole horde of armies and horses going to battle. And it scared off the Arameans. And these dudes feasted sumptuously on all the food that the Arameans had left behind. Because they decided not to stay at the cotton picking gate. They decided to say, why do we sit here and die? How many of y'all think this is going to be a good series? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Wow, what a life that you paint. What a picture. A life that is truly life. An abundant life, Lord. The highest quality of life a human being could possibly ever live. And not only live it in a, in a moderate way, but live it in a manner that is exceeding abundantly and supremely Father, because there is no end to your grandness and your bigness. Father, instill a deep-seated desire in all of us to long for more, to want for more of our lives than where we're at even today. Perhaps we're enjoying our lives to the full, 
Father, help us, help us, help us to desire more because the life is there available for us. In Jesus' name, amen.